Hello and welcome to Forum IAS. Today is 27th January 2023 and these are all the news articles that we will be seeing today. Their relevance to the exam are indicated here. The first article is about Etikopaka toy craft. Why is it in news? It is because Mr. C. V. Raju was conferred Padma Shri in art category. He is a craftsman who makes these Etikopaka wooden toys. In that context, we now have to see what are these Etikopaka wooden toys. So basically, Etikopaka is a small village near Vishakapatnam, Andhra Pradesh. And these toys are made of soft wood and they have a distinctive lacquer coating. So the dyes that are used for making these toys are derived from natural sources like seeds, lacquer, bark, roots and leaves. So the art of making these etikopaka wooden toys are known as turned wood lacquer craft. So this is the name turned wood lacquer craft. Um, a special feature of this etikopaka toys is that a uh, colorless resinous secretion of insect, this lac is used. So what happens is these vegetable dyes which are already prepared, they are mixed with the lac which is the resin. Okay, so first they will make the toys, they will coat the toys with the vegetable dyes and then over them a lac finishing, this resin is painted. So, when they dry, there is an oxidation process and during that oxidation process, these dyes and lac gets mixed. So, after that, the end product is very lustrous. See, here we have the Etikopaka toys. They are very lustrous because of this lacquer, okay. Uh, and this particular dye is exported all over the world and also these toys have GI tag. So, they have uh, themes of devotion also, they also have normal toys and if you see there are no edges in these toys, any toy, see even there are no sharp edges. So, they are very much safe for children, okay. So, that is about Etikopaka Bommalu, that is called as Etikopaka Bommalu in Telugu and uh, these toys, they are coming into prominence. And the next article is about Aditya L1 mission. So, India's first mission to study the sun will begin in June or July. So, this Aditya L1 mission will start in June or July and it is India's first space mission to observe the sun and the solar corona. And this L1 mission will be launched into the L1 point that is the L1 orbit. Uh, L1 is the first Lagrangian point of the Sun Earth solar system. The advantage of this L1 orbit is that the mission Aditya L1 can look at the Sun continuously. We will see what is a Lagrangian point, what is L1 point, what is the advantage of L1 point in later slides. So before that we have to see what are the payloads available. Uh, there are basically 7 payloads that are available in this L1 Aditya mission and primary payload is visible emission line coronograph and this particular VELC is designed and fabricated by Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Bengaluru. The other six payloads are designed and fabricated by ISRO and other institutions. So basically this VELC will be able to observe the corona continuously and because it is observing continuously, there is a constant supply of data and this data will answer many questions in the field of solar astronomy. So, this particular mission, it can image the sun as close as 1.05 times the solar radius. That close, it's, it can observe the sun. That doesn't mean it will, uh, this mission will go to that far near the sun, it will be there in the L1 point and it can observe up till that point. We will hold the camera and take 
picture of a far away object right similarly this l1 mission is a very big camera uh, to understand it in simpler terms or over simplified terms it can observe as close as 1.05 times the solar radius so it can do imaging spectroscopy polarimetry all at the same time and it can take observations at very high resolution and these observations it can take many observations in a second itself that powerful this mission is so india's space based astronomy mission the first mission was actually astrosat and aditya is the second space based astronomy mission and pslv will be used to launch this mission this mission will study sun's corona photosphere chromosphere solar emissions solar winds and flares and coronal mass ejection these are the layers of the sun here it is indicated see actually corona is not one of the layer of the sun it is the outer outer environment of the sun see it is not labeled to any particular layer in the sun it is the outer surrounding area of the sun that is the corona this can be asked in some tricky mcqs and then the outer layer is chromosphere which has the temperature of 4000 to 8000 kelvin the next inner layer is the photosphere this layer is visible from the earth and it is cooler than the outer layer 4000 to 6500 kelvin there is this temperature anomaly but for this particular discussion we need not go into the depth all right so um we saw the objective of this mission we saw the payload of this mission now we have to see about lagrange points so they are the positions in space for a two body system so if we take earth and moon it is a two body system earth and sun two body system so what happens is there are two bodies so imagine this is this area okay this area is the sun and this area is the earth so between these two bodies there is a point wherein there is equalization of attraction as well as repulsion so what happens is at this point if there is any satellite that is placed it has some inherent advantages so lagrange point is a position in space where the gravitational forces of two body system produce enhanced regions of attraction and repulsion okay so it is a place wherein the gravitational force the sun's pull is balanced out by the centripetal force so if we place a satellite in this point it will be normalized and it will remain in position without any extra emission of fuel without any extra usage of fuel that is why this point is very important i hope you got it l1 point this particular point is 1.5 million kilometer from the earth i'll repeat again so this l1 point or any lagrange point there is sun and there is another body between these two bodies there is a midpoint uh, where the gravitational force of the sun and the centripetal force of the planet they are both balanced that is called as lagrange point so it is normally for two body systems when the, it is relative to two bodies in the space okay between sun and earth there are totally five points and out of that l1 point is what is chosen for aditya mission already as i told fuel consumption to that is required to remain in position will be less if the l1 point is chosen and another advantage of this l1 point is from this view point there is no eclipse so this aditya mission can view the sun continuously now what are the challenges of this mission first thing is distance the second thing is super hot temperature it is observing the star of our solar system which is the sun and there are some moving components in this mission so there is a risk of collision now what is the importance of this mission so we are studying the solar weather we already saw right we are studying solar winds 
flares, coronal mass ejection. So, the solar weather, it will have effect on the entire system. It will have effect on the earth's weather. It will impact our electronic systems, our satellites. So, if we are studying solar weather, it will be very crucial to understand the effects of it on our earth and we can track earth directed storms because of this mission and many instruments that are used in this L1 Aditya mission, they are manufactured for the first time in our country and this is also a step towards Atmanirbhartha. So, that is about the Aditya L1 mission. We saw what is L1, what is the objective of the mission, what are the payloads of the mission, what is the importance of this mission and finally we saw what are the challenges associated with this mission. Okay. Next article is a very interesting article about Japan starting to flush the Fukushima wastewater. So, what happened was in 2011. Tsunami flooded the Fukushima nuclear power plant and because of that radioactive materials got leaked and as a result of it the surrounding area of Fukushima became uninhabitable. So from this tsunami and related nuclear accident there was some nuclear wastewater and Japan is starting to flush out nearly 1.5 to 5 million tons of wastewater from this nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean. So, this water it was earlier used to cool reactors and because of this radioactive material leak it is now radioactive and this wastewater contains radioactive isotopes. So, what happened was that uh, uh, because of this tsunami the diesel generator was affected. So, because of the power failure, the coolant got radioactive. That is what happened here. The justification that is provided from Japan is that TEPCO, that is the body which treats the water. So, they are saying that TEPCO has sufficiently treated this water to remove most of the radioactive isotopes. And uh, as a result, it will release uh, water which is not that very contaminated radioactively and moreover all over the world nuclear power plants release water containing trace amounts of radioactive materials into large water bodies. So, this is not the first time that is the reasoning given by Japan. But what is the concern? Uh, so, when radioactive water is released, it will have impact on the ocean water, it will have impact on the marine life, it will have impact on fishers livelihood and even other countries in the area, even China, Australia, these countries have registered strong protest against Japan's decision to release this nuclear wastewater. And Japan is saying that we are reducing the amount of radionucleotides present in the water. But there is no known threshold below which even a radioactive water can be considered safe. So, as such, if it is containing radioactive material, it is not safe. It's not like uh, theft is theft. We know, right? Even if someone steals 5 million dollars or 0.5 paise, theft is still theft. Whether in large amount or in small amount, even if Japan is reducing the amount of uh, radionucleotides, it is still dangerous. That is what experts are saying. And uh, anyway, any discharge of radioactive material increases the risk of cancer. It can poison the fish in the area. Already South Korea in 2013, it affected a ban on eating fish caught in the vicinity of uh, Fukushima. So, this nuclear waste wa water, it has tritium. Though TEPCO is uh, saying that uh, this tritium is removed from this nuclear waste water, actually even if it is a trace amount of tritium, it is easily absorbed by the bodies of living creatures. And uh, reports that come from uh, their local news agencies, they say that there are other radi radionuclides like ruthenium, plutonium and uh, these radioactive material, these elements can persist for longer time. Even it is dangerous than this tritium. 
it will persist for longer time and uh, Experts are also saying that at present whatever data is provided by TEPCO that is insufficient. So what can be done? There are other options. Water can be stored for longer period. Why? Because this tritium which is the radioactive pollutant in that waste water has a half life of 12 to 13 years. So if this water is kept as such. What happens is the concentration of tritium will reduce by half in 12 to 13 years. So instead of it releasing now itself, it can be kept for some more years and then it can be released when the concentration has naturally reduced. And another issue is when Fukushima happened, there were protests in India also about the Kudankulam nuclear power plant. And it is situated in the areas which were hit by the 2004 tsunami, Indian Ocean tsunami. And this Fukushima plant was also affected by 2011 tsunami. So in India also there is concern about this. Okay, That is about releasing on nuclear waste water. What are the dangers? What could be the possible solution? The next one is about China influencing the tribal northeast areas and inducing insurgency in those areas. So basically this new news article, it talks about two research papers. We'll see what they are saying. So first research paper is saying that uh, this um, India-Myanmar border, Arunachal, Nagaland, Manipur, Mizoram. These are the four Indian states which form border with Mizoram. So Indian government is going to fence the border of India and Myanmar. So what happens is China is triggering the tribal organizations. Already tribal organizations are protesting against the fencing of this border. China is triggering them through a sense of alienation which means uh, a sense of not belonging to mainland India. The sense of um, disenchantment that is prevalent among the tribes. Disenchantment in terms of lack of facilities, lack of economic empowerment, lack of integration. All these things have led to tribal alienation and China is stoking these feelings and is triggering the tribes of these states to protest against this fencing. So why is uh, China doing that? is because through Myanmar only China is routing weapons to insurgents operating in the northeastern corridor. So China has a vested interest and it is making use of tribal discontentment in that area. And another research paper, uh, it claims that there were historical links between northeastern insurgents and China. So basically, uh, China, from China the arms go to Thailand and from there they enter India either through Bangladesh through this route or they enter India through this route that is Myanmar route. And uh, whenever China is doing arms smuggling, it uses these two countries to route arms to insurgents in India and this has been historically happening. That is what this second research paper says. So what can be done by India? They should not just do fencing. There can be a multimodal approach which India did in the Bangladesh border. That kind of a multimodal border management can be brought about by India. Second thing is uh, in order to win over China's influence, what we should do is we should win the minds of Northeast people with love and compassion. So that is possible by amicable settlements of disputes. That is what this article is talking about. This is relevant for internal security portion in GS3 and the important tribes of this area are Adi, Mizo tribes, Karbis, Kukki tribes, Rengma, Bodo and Diori tribes. Sometimes uh, in match the following questions, the name of the tribe is given and the region is given. So for that purpose, you have to memorize these tribes. Then the final article of the day is about forest cover. So what the article says is that India is lagging in increasing the quality of trees as targeted in the Green India mission. 
So, before that we have to see what is national mission for a green India. In order to tackle climate change, there was a national action plan for climate change and there were 8 submissions in the national action plan for climate change NAPCC. In those 8 missions, one of the mission is this Green India mission. And the aim of this mission is to protect, restore and enhance India's forest cover and thereby responding to climate change. And the target is 10 million hectares on forest and non-forest lands to increase tree or forest cover. So why is tree cover important? It is critical to sequester carbon. And as a result, carbon stocks of India will improve. Trees consume carbon dioxide and they become carbon stocks. So, national mission for a green India. Um, the central objectives are improving the quality of forests, improving the ecosystem services. That forest provides uh, water percolation, maintenance of water table, uh, housing of the wildlife these are all the ecosystem services provided by the forest so by this mission we are also improving the ecosystem services provided by the forest and involvement of gram sabha in implementation thereby grassroots level institutions are also strengthened by this green india mission and once we are doing tree plantation, it will increase livelihood for local communities. Uh, say for example, Gram Sabha can do this mission through um, MNREGS, Narega work, right? So that will improve the livelihood. And as a result, there would be fuel wood and fodder for local communities. In terms of uh, non-timber forest produce, minor forest products. And then strengthening of regulatory framework for conservation. These are all some objectives of National Mission for a Green India. Coming back to the report, uh, the report says that in 17 states, the green cover had increased by 26,287 hectares. But quality is improved only in 1,2096 hectares. So having trees is one thing, but having quality forest cover or tree cover is another thing. Okay. So basically for this mission, center had allotted 681 crore, but only 525 crore had been utilized and the states which are lagging behind are Andhra Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Madhya Pradesh, Kerala but silver lining is that Punjab which is one of the states which least forest cover it had committed 629 hectares but it has delivered 1082 hectares okay so this is about the article that is given here now we will move to the questions for the day the first question, this was also asked in one of the previous years. Which of the following best describes the aim of Green India Mission by the Government of India? So, the first statement is incorporating environmental benefits and costs into the union and state budgets, thereby implementing the green accounting. Second statement, launching the second green revolution to enhance agricultural output so as to ensure food security to one and all in the future. Third statement, restoring and enhancing forest cover and responding to climate change by a combination of adaptation and mitigation measures. Select the correct answer using the code given below. So here, this Green India mission, we already studied that. It has nothing to do with budget. It has nothing to do with agriculture. It is about enhancing forest cover and responding to climate change. So, answer is C, 3 only. Next question, this was asked in prelims 2019. We have to arrange these states in terms of percentage of forest cover to the total area of the state. So, basically the answer for this question is C, 3, 2, 4, 1. So, among this, uh, this is ascending order which means small to big. Among this, the lowest is Maharashtra, then we have Madhya Pradesh, then we have Odisha and finally Chhattisgarh. So, in, in the 
स्टेट हाउ मच परसेंटेज ऑफ द स्टेट एरिया इज कवर्ड विथ फॉरेस्ट इन टर्म्स ऑफ अब्सल्यूट एरिया मध्य प्रदेश इज हाइएस्ट बट एस अ परसेंटेज इट वेरीज ओके सो द आंसर इज सी so that's it for today's discussion follow us on all the social media platforms like comment share subscribe this is indumati signing off thank you bye bye